Welcome to the Plant Engineering Webcast. Improve Industrial Facility Energy Management, a process-based approach. Sponsored by Schneider Electric. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Plant Engineering Magazine. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you are experiencing issues with your slides or your audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Type questions for our speaker in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with a link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion, a PDF copy of the presentation, and other additional resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of the webcast. I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished presenter, Ram Kaushik. Ram has more than 25 years of experience in technical and business roles in engineering, IT, and software development. He is U.S. Offer Manager at Schneider Electric's Digital Power Division and manages strategic marketing direction for energy and power reliability management offers within Schneider Electric's EcoStructure Power Software Suite. He manages a portfolio of hardware, software, and services targeted toward industrial, commercial facilities, data centers, and healthcare. He presents frequently at seminars, industry forums, and technology panels. Ron began his career as an automation applications engineer at American Electric Power in 1989. After that, he worked in industrial automation and power systems applications at Square D before venturing into software consulting career a series of technology companies and startups. He has worked as an offer manager for Schneider Electric since 2012. He has an MBA from ben Vanderbilt University, an MS in engineering from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thanks for joining us today, Ram. We're delighted to have you here, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate being here today. And I hope, firstly, that our audience and their families are safe during this very, very strange and disturbing year. Uh, happy to join you to talk about this topic of relating energy management with process in industry. Uh, the learning objectives are up in front of you. And the idea is for you to become a little more familiar with some market trends in this area. Uh, also look at some design considerations that we at Schneider have uh, experienced while implementing these systems at our own manufacturing plants. So this is not necessarily something uh, that we are only selling to other customers. It's something that we are practicing ourselves in our own manufacturing facilities. So uh, the agenda today, we will look at uh, firstly, the market trends in this area, and more importantly, what those market trends mean at the facility level. Secondly, like I said, we will look at some solution considerations that we have found from uh, experience. I'm sure our uh, audience of engineers have probably varied experience, which you know they can bring to bear upon this. Uh, thirdly, we will look at a couple of case studies at uh, two facilities where we have we have uh, implemented these systems. Next, we look at the lessons learned 
uh, sort of a summary of what we have learned and how we are putting those into practice. And lastly, uh, I this is probably a little bit of a, a, a sidebar, but I thought it was important to include that there are some important energy visualizations which are becoming more popular for good reason. And I want to give you some examples as to how those visualizations can help improve your facility. Okay, let's jump in to the first section, which is the market trends in this area and the implications at facility level. Traditionally, if you look at these uh, energy management systems, they have gathered energy data in sort of a silo, disconnected from other production systems like process, machine state, uh, or other MES and building management systems, automation systems, et cetera, which have often valuable context data. If at all we integrate those into the energy management systems, they can be haphazard and sort of piecemeal. So that's sort of one piece of the story where the, this kind of energy data and the process data are in, are in different silos. Simultaneously, there are standards and initiatives for these continuous energy management programs, sustainability reporting, et cetera. And the say, state of the union, right, in this area is that without this process context, managing those energy efficiency programs and actually sort of checking the box on these standards becomes quite difficult and challenging. Okay, so this is sort of a, a, a summary of uh, the state of the union. So given this context, uh, let's look at two different trends which are reshaping this landscape. One is the development of new software analytics tools. Right? So the tools are getting better. Uh, analyzing energy costs, allocating costs. So there's lots of different new tools coming out. And the, what that does is it, it sort of makes the return on investment of integrating data between process and energy more apparent. Right. So the, the return on investment was not maybe exposed as much as it is today. So now, uh, you know, it's very difficult to sustain the argument that that data is in a different system, right? That's, that's just the benefits of data integration between these systems is becoming very clear. So that's sort of the first trend. The second trend is sort of bottom up, right? The first one is top down. This one is bottom up where devices that capture energy and other uh, you know, contextual information are increasingly becoming more sophisticated. I don't need to tell you guys this, this is pretty obvious. Um, and there is pressure to answer, what this does is, is the, the intelligence of bottom-up devices brings even more pressure to answer energy questions in the context of critical processes. And we, we look at what this, I will land this plane in a minute, right? I just want you to look at the two different trends and the pressure it brings to the existing uh, landscape. Okay, what's the net result of this, right? Like I said, um, you can look at this in the context of this ISA uh, reference model, which is sort of a useful conceptual way to look at uh, data and, and how, they, how it relates between different systems. So if you look at the SCADA reference model here, uh, there's, there is level, sort of these lower levels where there's devices uh, and, and then above that there is a system management or a supervisory control and enterprise systems. Energy management tools may belong in level four whereas process level control and monitoring may, may be, belong in say level two. So what that does is it, it, there's a lot of pressure in connecting these two, uh, in bridging this disconnect between the IT and the OT worlds, if you will, right? 
so that's uh, that's sort of at a high level now what does what impact does that have at the operator or at the industrial plant manager level so the questions that they're trying to answer today are considerably different uh, it, it is not sufficient to maybe categorize energy in, in buckets which are isolated from process. They, they want to typically isolate and categorize energy costs during maybe non-production periods. They want to allocate energy costs to units of production. Maybe report metrics by cost center. Uh, they often want visibility into uh, metrics about energy and uh, other costs uh, when processes are maybe idled or starved of parts. Uh, and uh, often this is a multi-site uh, KPI uh, comparison, right? So if you think of, say, Procter & Gamble, they want to compare energy costs. There is some executive uh, who wants to compare how energy costs per assembly line uh, process compares to find, to isolate good and bad performance. So these are sort of very tangible metrics that these executives and plant managers are chasing. Right? In, in maybe yesterday's system, calculating these metrics wasn't that straightforward. Uh, we're certainly getting better, and I want to tell you, of course, what's getting better. Uh, so what we found in Schneider is when we examined our own plants and we assessed the situation, uh, we found that we really needed a more prescriptive and sort of a standardized approach that we could apply across all our manufacturing plants. So I'm not going to go through the, all the nitty gritty of this slide, but essentially these, if you look at the broad uh, themes, Plant managers are after energy costs, increasing operational efficiency. The middle one, which is sustaining the energy savings over time, is a big one, right? Often you find uh, people who have run energy programs a lot will find, the, you know, you hit the low-hanging fruit, but then uh, the performance sort of tapers off. Um, so baselining and monitoring continuously and sustaining these energy savings. Often energy savings drift back. You know, bad behaviors start cropping in uh, and if you don't keep your eye on the ball, right? Standardizing these energy management practices across plants and uh, tracking energy in terms of uh, doing the calculations required for carbon emissions <coughs> is also important. So I mentioned ISO 50001 here, and I'm, I let me unpack what that is. So a few years ago, Schneider Electric uh, manufacturing plants sort of committed to this ISO 50001 standard. Uh, essentially, it is a, a framework to manage um, energy efficiency programs, and it follows this um, uh, sort of plan, do, check, act, uh, circle, right? So it's a continuous management and it has very formal checkpoints. There is uh, there is uh, program methodology that's followed. There is tracking metrics. There's, there are KPIs. So it's, it's, it's a very systematic approach to industrial energy management. Um, and you can, uh, you know, we, we have embraced it pretty heavily in Schneider and you can see, you know, it's, it's, it's really it's not just uh, sort of we're not doing lip service, right? We're actually making, uh, you know, doing significant cost savings using this. Uh, there's a case study that the Department of Energy did, and there's other vendors uh, involved in ISO 50001. Uh, there's also the Superior Energy Performance Program, which is a certification that's sort of one grade up. Um, and this, we have achieved that as well, right? So I want to show you how we have done this, right? So we'll take a couple of examples and we'll look at uh, some, you know, really nitty gritty on, okay, how did, how did this happen? 
Okay, so that's sort of a very, very quick view of where the industry is, uh, the landscape, the tools, the pressures that are changing the game, and what they mean to uh, individual manufacturing plants. All right, so now next, let's look at some uh, con uh, solution considerations that we went through uh, and some designs and architectures. Uh, I, I want to sort of look at the thinking that went behind how we approached uh, what we did. All right, so we found that, you know, the before state, is energy data had been collected sort of at the facility level, maybe some submetering at various feeder levels. Um, but it wasn't that the, the link between that and what exactly was going on in the plant was not there at all. Right? So our goal was to correlate these manufacturing processes to energy usage. And we had, I'll show you the states and things, analysis that we did. Uh, and the idea was to, to some more detailed energy analysis and maybe even alarms uh, to, to isolate wasted energy during non-production periods. So you can think of this as bridging that level two and four in that ISA 99 model that I showed you earlier. Um, so that, that, that was sort of the goal of the exercise. All right, let's look at some of the design considerations that went into our, our thinking. So the first thing that we, and, and if, if you're a manufacturing plant sort of looking at this, uh, you need to have a pretty good understanding of what are the processes or machines that can, be, can actually need an energy association, right? So you, you have to be able to articulate which processes are worth uh, analyzing, right? It's, it's knowing what not to do. Uh, you know, that's as important as knowing what to do. Right? If, so, if you need to have some understanding of processes and machines that have, that need these energy associations. What are the states or associations you want to analyze energy by? Okay, what is worth it? Do you want to dissect energy by product types? Let's say your your uh, Nissan uh, is it valuable for you to look at energy by you know I don't know some example like a Pathfinder versus an Altima, right? In other contexts, maybe you might have uh, idle states, right, where your machine is do, undergoing maintenance or you're actually waiting for parts, right? That could be another uh, another state. And we look at some more examples, practical examples of this. You have to have an idea of what your monitoring infrastructure at the plant is, what you, where you can get data from and what you don't have data for, and therefore we'll have to add. How can you interface with these, the energy system, energy management system with the process system? Is it PLC uh, managing these, uh, plant systems or is it, I mean, are you going to pick it up through discrete uh, IO? So that's a decision point and there's, it's, there's, it's not a one size fits all, but you have to kind of analyze this to figure out what is, um, you know, what's the appropriate point to do this. Documentation was surprisingly, uh, uh, it looks like an uh, unimportant thing, but we, we had a lot of trouble <laughs> uh, at, at a couple of sites where you know, actually digging into what was out there and how to interface what turned out to be pretty challenging. Uh, and the older your plant is, the harder it is to track your as-builts and things like that. Um, what are the KPIs that management is after? So that's another, you know, is it energy units or do you want to actually relate it to energy tariffs and actually come up with with, with dollar values, right? So that's that's another fairly, I mean, it's a, it's a decision that has implications, let me put it that way. All right, so choosing KPIs for energy consumption analysis is also uh, an important call, right? So you may want to slice 
data by energy data by machine state. So I give some examples here, um, automatic, maybe stage one, stage two, or bypassed. It could be a process state. Uh, you could have something that's, um, you, you may want to isolate energy when uh, parts are either blocked or starved. You're sort of waiting on, uh, you know, this is a process efficiency thing, right? So usually manufacturing guys are all over this, but it, it, they, what they lack is a visibility into, uh, well, energy when, the picture of energy when they are scheduling uh, various processes, right? So that, that's, that's the context we are trying to add. Uh, idling between shifts, weekends, et cetera. Uh, energy per unit of production at various assembly stages. So if you are in a, in a you know, paint line versus a parts assembly line, you may want to examine per unit of production. So normalized by per, per unit of production because absolute values don't necessarily mean a whole lot. Energy by product type. So I'll, I'll show you an example from one of our plants uh, as well, but this is another example from a beverage plant where you may want to compare energy by various uh, types of, uh, you know, beverage filling, for example. So choosing KPIs is important. All right, so those, that was a very quick summary of sort of design constraints that that you have to go through when um, planning this integration between your energy system, energy management system, and your process system. Let's now look at a, a couple of our practical cases where we have implemented some of this stuff, right? So the first example is from the Square D plant at Smyrna, uh, Tennessee. Oops. Go too far. There we go. Okay, that's a very sort of simplistic uh, schematic of of what we did. So um, once we analyzed where the bang for the buck was, and we went through that thinking process, right? We we isolated um, a, a PLC process where we could uh, we could actually get a handle on. Okay. You know, we needed this uh, process states data, which is, you know, is the oven in operation or shut down, and if the conveyor is running or idle. Without getting the specifics of the process, that was sort of the core of, and we also needed to pick up some metering values from uh, from the process and, and integrate that into our uh, energy and uh, power management system. So, after we isolated that data and uh, we actually started collecting it and analyzing it, and I'm going to show you some results from that. Um, some, you know, the first, um, I would say, <laughs> very simplistic uh, energy analysis, which brought very tangible results. I mean, it's very simple stuff, right? I mean, there's if you look at this chart, it's, uh, you know, somebody's uh, bubba hasn't, uh, let's just say, uh, gone through all the process shutdown uh, that that should have happened. I mean, there's this energy use during idle times, right, which, which was exposed. Some of it might be legitimate, but at least the data is now transparent. This wasn't very clear before because the energy system is running in a silo compared to the process. Okay, so now it's sort of making the relationship between these two very visible. So after we ran it for a few months, um, you can see, you know, the energy usage. Um, this is the oven oven usage, and you could see, you know, definite improvement once we exposed the data to the plant uh, managers and they go through this audit for the ISO 50001, trying to identify energy efficiency uh, opportunities. So the first improvement is really uh, what I call operational changes. So process, people, and procedures, right? Um, so maybe 
they're not following a, a, a systematic shutdown process, right? So once you enforce that, you start getting some benefits. So that's sort of the operational piece of this. And then the programming, which is changes that optimize the process itself. So that gets you the sort of the next layer of the onion. So as you can see, you know, we, we made some significant progress uh, as part of the ISO 50001, uh, you know, part of the ISO 50001 process in Smona. The other thing we did was setting up, you know, proactive alarms. So if you look at, um, we isolated, we created alarms. Once once we tied the data together, we are, we are able to generate alarms like, okay, fans running when conveyor idle. Without that context, you know, it's impossible to alarm, right? It's That alarm is impossible to convey usefully. So we were able to sort of create some of these uh, oven shutdown, alarm, you know, energy usage alarms when something should not be happening. Um, and that, that again, when you expose the alarm, uh, operators, you know, respond to that much more effectively. Um, and yeah, this is an example of, of the, the first time we, we sort of did the, uh, did the programming change and it's, you know, very quick payback, right? It's, it's literally, uh, I think, you know, 31% energy savings for that one month that we saw. So very, um, un, you know, it's obviously you're not going to be able to sustain that run rate every month, but, but it's pretty significant what we were able to do during that period. And you know we use that pilot to to estimate maybe larger systems, um, and we got some pretty good uh, numbers. Uh, you know even using uh, conservative estimates, we could get we, we came up with some payback numbers to justify our our investment in the next plant. Uh, and you know as your motor size and your energy usage, you know, as your mowers get larger, your payback's going to get better on these kinds of integration. All right, let's look at the second case, which is uh, a slightly larger scope that we tried at Lexington, Kentucky, which is a circuit breaker um, plant. Uh, we attacked sort of the paint process. Uh, this is a This is a whole quick schematic for those who are interested. It, you know, there's a loading system, uh, some cleaning, treatment, uh, paint, and there's also an oven um, for paint dry, and then a, uh, you know, there's other, and then an unloader. So it's a fairly big plant in, uh, in Lexington, uh, Kentucky. I apologize. So, the uh, here's another schematic of the Lexington system. Again, you know, there's some pre-engineering work to figure out what the process states you want to isolate are, where the production, you know, what production data you want to uh, integrate into the energy management system. Uh, so, you know, we, we it's it's possible to make it too ambitious, and then you don't, you know, you don't get anything done, right? <laughs> So we tried to resist that, and we, we made a very, very concise list of data we wanted to integrate. Um, you can see the process states here and the production data that we integrated into the energy system. Um, probably that uh, graphic is not very clear, but let me see if I can uh, point out uh, some things here. So. On the left, what, what we were able to plot was electricity consumed relative to conveyor operation. So we were able to look at energy usage based on whether conveyors are running or not. We could look at uh, energy uh, consumed relative to oven operation. Uh, so a few, and then relative to E coat, which is the, the paint coat operation. So again, Pretty, once the data integration is done, right? This is this is very easy for an operator to consume 
and act upon. And we were again able to identify savings opportunities during off, off periods, right? So we were able to dig into why this was, what was causing this energy usage and clamp down on, on and change processes. The other sort of side benefit that we got was to be able to identify energy consumption anomalies. So if we exposed energy cost for say the conveyors running empty, right? That's, that's one thing. The other thing, the other point was we were able to analyze uh, energy cost disparities between different product mixes. So in the, in this case, you know, we had a couple of different uh, uh, product mix, product uh, types here, cold rolled, steel, and galvanized, where we could say, okay, maybe there should be a disparity, right? Maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. But before, you had no exposure to this data. You had no, you didn't, simply didn't know what you didn't know, right? Uh, now, we have more access to this sort of rela relational data and we can make good decisions based on it. Uh, in the extreme case, they, I, you know, we ran an analysis where it might even make sense to change the product mix, right? If you think about um, how energy is paid for, the energy contracts based on on-peak, off-peak, and energy contracts uh, which utilities are written, uh, there is a case to actually shift production mixes based on energy costs. I mean, if, if you can do it, if you're running a two shift shop, it might be possible to stagger a shift by two hours and, and change production schedules. Now, plant managers don't like that approach very much, right? But you have, if you have the data to support uh, your, it's worth at least analyzing. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You can at least analyze the data and say, yes, the production mix and the production scheduling system is efficient. Uh, but if you cannot relate energy mixes to your production scheduling, you have no idea, right? So that was another um, sort of aha moment for us. So again, we were able to associate energy mix with uh, product mix. Uh, and it's, you know, it uh, you could, like I argued before, you could change the product mix uh, to, to potentially change the profitability of your output. The other side benefit that we got was um, we, we were also monitoring some key uh, machine equipment because we had integrated it into the energy and power system. So we were examining pumps and uh, we could look at energy usage of uh, things like aeration blowers, which weren't being monitored before. And we were able to do some long-term analysis, right? So you could see uh, a performance drift. So you, we could actually see, okay, you know, what's going on? I mean, is this some scheduled maintenance that was mixed, missed? Uh, so you could do some condition-based uh, monitoring uh, and impact the process significantly. In this case, if I recall correctly, we showed this to the plant manager, uh, but we couldn't take an outage to actually <laughs> do anything about it within that time window. But uh, we at least made them aware um, that this was an issue, um, and you know, hopefully you can address it during the next time you you take an outage. So this is again, like like I said, it's sort of a side benefit. It wasn't wasn't within our our scope uh, really, but um, well worth doing. We quantified energy costs. So this is a useful thing for manufacturing plants to consider. Is often um, if you're if you're able to quantify using your energy rates it makes it a lot more tangible when you say, you know, it's 
it's costing you 12 cents per um, you know per uh, part that goes through the carrier in this case it's two different product types uh, which have different cost curves we also uh, generated uh, shadow builds this is this is another powerful mechanism and some of this is recommended use in the ISO 50001 uh, program maintenance right if you expose energy costs in tangible numbers and do internal billing it really drives behavior so you, you get a lot more eyes looking at it when you have to sign a check for it <laughs> Uh, before it was maybe hidden in internal costs, but now uh, it, it exposes uh, exposes this information. Okay, um, so given our experience in these at these plants, and also um, uh, you know, we, 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 of course, market and sell this to other companies as well, right? So we, we are using our own solutions at our own plants, but we also obviously also sell them elsewhere. Uh, let's look at what lessons we learned from applying these uh, practices. So the observed benefits, and some of this is like tangible and some of it is intangible, right? So you have to always be able to quantify what, what you can't uh, you know, quite expose. So where energy costs are optimized at process level, there's pretty good ROI. Uh, increase situational awareness, like I showed you when you expose the costs, it brings process optimization. There's definitely more ownership by stakeholders. Uh, individual departments now have tools rather than a corporate uh, energy czar having that data. Um, this is data that's bottom up, so plant floor people have have the data. Uh, and you know, exposing, you know, isolating this process and facility uh, use can you can identify savings opportunity. So in the, in our examples, we we were able to increase loaded production, uh, we reduced production over time, uh, and other other benefits. Measure measurement and verification. Uh, is a very important uh, part of standards compliance or and it's just generally good practice. Um, ISO 50001 is an excellent framework for, for you know, to follow energy efficiency compliance and we'll, we'll look at adoption of ISO 50000 if we have some time. Um, I, I can mention it a little bit, but it's an excellent framework for um, uh, for to tie this process and energy story together. So that's that's sort of a, a very quick view of the benefits we observed. Um, clearly, process and energy correlation. The the what the, the the flow that I described is not the only way to do it. Right? Clearly, there's many ways to skin this cat. We can make that association at the MES and at the facility energy power management system, uh, what I call the top level. You can do it at the bus level, which is sort of the electrical bus distribution level. Process level is what I've described. And there's also like a very manual uh, level where you can make data entries in these systems. Our argument and our experience is that the process level makes a lot of sense. You don't have to do one or the other. You can do, you know, there's more, you can attack one, more than one. But process level has very strong benefits. Uh, top level, adoption from, a, like I said, at the plant level is, is poorer because the data is coming from some corporate uh, system. So you have to sort of build that trust, right? It takes longer. The bus level is sort of electrically oriented, and it's not the, uh, building that association. The process is much, much harder. So we, I would argue that process level is, is a very good mix, very good balance. If you were to compare the, the sort of the top level and process level, integrating 
if you compare integrating between those two levels, there's many advantages, right? So it's, uh, there's, there's standardization uh, is easier. Uh, there is, you get some side benefits from, from examining sort of power quality areas, for example, because you are um, already monitoring process level electrical data. Uh, it's easier maybe, it's sometimes lower tech solutions work better. You can integrate with the process PLC and maybe the meter, and that's a lot easier than building some complex API software integration. So lots of advantages here. Again, I'm not arguing that it's the only way, but it's we, we found some benefits here. Okay, finally, like I said, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to show you some improved, um, I mean, we've, we've taken a look at what the advantages of integrating energy and process are, some, you know, some, some of our case, case studies based on uh, our experience. We've looked at lessons learned. Uh, now this is, like I said, sort of a sidebar, uh, but I thought it's important to include here because there's some energy visualizations and some deeper analytics that are coming out, uh, which which really make life <laughs> a lot easier for the operator. So I'm going to just throw some examples at you guys to see uh, to sort of show you what is possible. Right. So heat maps are pretty powerful. Uh, we've used them in several of our examples here. You can identify hot spots. Um, so here's an example where a gas meter was running uh, at a time where it should not have, right? We didn't run a third shift. What happened, right? Did we not do an orderly shutdown of the oven after shift two? Can you get this data through other ways, other means? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it easier to see in a heat map like this? I would argue yes. Another example, um, packaging. Um, here's a packaging example. So it's a split of uh, energy usage intensity, so it's normalized, between these processes, packer, palletizer, labeler, and production and we can compare that to an energy intensity target, right? And say, look, are we meeting the energy intensity target? Are we exceeding it? Uh, maybe in this case, the idling efficiency wasn't good enough. So there's, there's data that pops out from this kind of visualization. Uh, it's a lot easier to understand this and assimilate rather than, you know, you could certainly get the data in, you know, in a complicated Excel spreadsheet or something, uh, but <laughs> this is easier to do something with. Uh, the other area which is, which is, uh, you know, companies are doing more of is, is forecasting used based on energy modeling tools. So we've, we've done some of this, uh, or some of our software does this. Uh, we can build an energy model. Here's an example where we've built a model and we are tracking it versus actuals. And you can see the energy usage appears to be less than forecasted. So now either the model is not super accurate, which is possible, uh, or uh, there's, there's some kind of uh, production machine failure or something like that or uh, it's real maybe we did we 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 did something that improved uh, energy usage and we need to replicate it in our you know 10 other plants that we have across the world uh, tracking the performance versus the model and looking at residual you know uh, value and then saying okay if you put in an energy efficiency program how does your model change Okay, what, what is this used for? Well, if you have an accurate for energy forecasting model, you can budget better. You can actually take this forecasted energy model to a utility negotiation um, when you're negotiating rates, for example, right? So building models is another uh, new, newish 
sort of tool that companies are beginning to use now. Uh, I might have mentioned this before, but comparing energy consumption by process, stages of production is useful. Uh, in this case, right, in this example, the compressor uh, energy intensity has drifted. So if you look at it every month and you find that the energy intensity has changed, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sign that maybe, you know, something's not quite right either maintenance or you need to, like I said, replace uh, replace the machine. Okay, so let us uh, let me quickly sort of summarize. Uh, we are at 45, so good. So we, we let me summarize for the next five minutes. That should give us time for some good Q&A. So we've looked at um, the landscape of this uh, energy and process boundary uh, what what the situ what the landscape is today what the market trends are that are changing the game uh, like i said we we've implemented some practices at our schneider facilities related to our iso 50001 energy management program uh, we've used our own systems of course uh, we've used our own software to do the analysis uh, i shared the uh, data from two different case cases in, in our own plants. We looked at some of the lessons learned and the best practices that we found. And I pointed out some advantages of integrating this data at the process level uh, versus integrating at other MES level or enterprise level or um, you know, bus level or at the uh, manual level, all of which have benefits as well. It's like I said, it's not a one one size fits all and you can do a hybrid mix of these. And we also looked at some visualizations that are coming up uh, in the newer software. So the conclusion we have come to and hopefully I've communicated that is, you know, industrial energy management is a journey, right? It's not really a destination. Um, you have energy performance improves and then regresses in some cases. Um, so you have to sort of keep, it's a continuous energy, continuous management process, which is what the ISO 50001 uh, management cycle stresses. So you have to kind of keep at it. Um, and sometimes the, you know, the, the benefits get smaller but the problem is if you take your eye off, you'll find uh, you know, the, the losses are pretty substantial. Uh, and of course, uh, I will mention the next frontier. Um, I think if you don't mention artificial intelligence in a, in a webinar, um, uh, you, you lose uh, TRPs or something, I'm told. So I will mention the two, the two buzzwords, AI and machine learning and uh, but definitely these technologies are uh, adding, you know, adding a lot of pizzazz to, to sort of predictive uh, energy forecasting uh, and how process scheduling can change based on, based on this uh, technology. Okay, very good. I'm going to turn it over to you, Jack, um, for hopefully some good uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Ram, for that uh, very informative and very interesting presentation. Um, now our presenter will answer questions from the audience. Type your questions for Ram Kaushik in the Ask Question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online with the archived version of the webcast. Remember, to download a certificate of completion, a copy of the presentation, and other resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Okay, let's get to these questions. Uh, are you, uh, Ram, are you seeing more adoption of the ISO 50001 standards for uh, energy management programs? Uh, yes, good question. Yes, definitely we are. Um, and I'll tell you the main driver. It's it's actually uh, if you look at the adoption of ISO 50001 globally, 
in multinational companies, the ones which have a strong presence, say, in other parts of the world, uh, APAC uh, or Europe or the Middle East, it's, it's actually more substantial. But what has happened is the global entities which have a significant presence in those countries or manufacturing facilities across the world are also requiring their North American counterparts to to follow suit, right? So they are sort of mandating that, you know, thou shalt uh, implement this because we want to compare the plant in Kyoto, Japan with the plant in Moscow, Russia versus the plant in Kentucky, right? So the you will follow the same metrics, the same KPIs, which means uh, they're also putting ma uh, program management down to achieve, to sort of do this continuous ISO 50001 management. Good question, and yes, we are definitely seeing more adoption. Uh, global consistency and global, un uh, global units. Absolutely. And it's also, the, the other point is, it's not necessary that the standard should drive your, uh, you know, practical adoption of this energy management versus process methodology, right? It's even if you don't have any mandate to follow the standard, it's it just makes sense, <laughs> saves money <laughs> and makes sense. How do you handle uh, integration between the process and energy management systems when different vendors are involved? Ah, uh, yes. So this is a this is a question where uh, what shall we say? This is where the the rubber meets the road, right? It's uh, practical, uh, and the answer is uh, the economist answer, right? It depends. Um, what we have found is we start with the lowest tech integration possible. I mean, if if you can get that integration through a really cheap wiring solution i mean if you can get it get at it through io or plc register state uh, then that's what i would vote for the, the lowest tech solution that makes sense as you get higher up in sophistication you're looking at i you know uh, programming apis to to uh, to get the data from other systems you could look at opc you could look at uh, uh, you know, web services integration, software integration. Now you're getting, you know, you're adding A, complexity, B, uh, maintainable costs, right? But sometimes it has to be done. So the answer is uh, it just depends on what, where the energy system has to go get data from. But it is it is a good question, and we, we have to have a different answer every time we, we attack the problem. Okay, at what point does the cost outweigh the benefits? And this ca question came in uh, when you were around slide 17, if you need some context for that one. Um, okay, I'm not going to bother to go back to slide 17 to figure out uh, what the actual, let me see if I can, I can, um, I can frame the answer appropriately. So, yes. Let's be clear. Uh, the, you, there is you were choosing KPIs for energy consumption analysis. Ah, okay. So it, picking the KPIs is, of course, important. The There is certainly tangible implementation cost to stitching the data from the energy management system and the process, right? Let's not kid ourselves. There is cost involved. If you find that you're integrating at a very high software level and you know the costs of like the complexity of APIs and actually uh, making that data meaningful for the operator to take action, if you cannot achieve that, right, then I would say, yes, forget it. The costs are outweighing the benefit. Maybe living in data silos makes more sense, right? But from our experience, Jack, uh, wherever we have seen this done in a, in a systematic way, we have found that sometimes you can make very simple design decisions and, and have great impact. Good answer. <laughs> um, do you plan to start using um, 
regression analysis and QSUM, C U S U M. Ah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure question. what that is, but the, I'm sure that the, uh, the the person who asked the question knows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's cumulative sum. So basically, what it is for the rest of the listeners who are not familiar with the modeling. Um, so this is a a metric from the modeling vocabulary. The idea is if you um, regression analysis is is just a way to express uh, to forecast a model based on a bunch of independent variables. So those independent variables could be you know could be production, could be weather, could be any number of other things which change and which determine what your energy consumption should be. It's a prediction. And Q sum is the variance between your model and and uh, reality, right? So if you, for example, if you put in uh, variable frequency drives and you model what the energy usage should be before the before the implementation, and you track this cumulative cumulative sum, basically it's it's the variance that keeps adding, right? And then you look to see if Hey, you know, did, did the energy efficiency thing that you did does it have did it have good ROI? Uh, and so the question was, do you plan to start using it? Yes, absolutely. So our our software um, today, you know, has some uh, has some tools to do this. So we can build a regression model and track uh, cumulative sum. Uh, or, I mean, you know, there are many other statistical tools out there. You don't have to use ours, right? <laughs> There's many. Uh, if you, you know, if you if you have the right uh, expertise, you can build a model using some of those statistical tools and, and track it. But yes, this is it's getting to be more uh, more mainstream, I would say. Okay, what do you think the human skill factor to increase energy efficiency under machine AI system? Um, human skill factor. Can you re can you repeat that question, please, okay. Jack? Sorry, uh, it's number twelve. In case you're following along, what do you think is the human skill factor to increase energy efficiency under machine uh, artificial intelligence under a machine artificial intelligence system, AI system. Oh, okay. So, if, okay, the human skill factor is to actually, uh, in a way, the AI system requires good data and it needs human expertise to train the model, right? So the AI system is only as good as the data that's used to train the, the ML model. Right. So, I think that's where the going forward. That's where the human skill factor would be. Is if uh, the, if you if you can give the systems uh, good energy data and good predictions of okay, you know, if under these process conditions, this is what I expect the energy model to be. The 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 the, the systems kind of need that intelligent context, and that's where the human skill factor comes in. Just throwing dumb data at it is not going to help. Good answer. Last question. We have time for one more question. As presented, one of the most important savings is getting from the process up um, the process optimization. In this matter, does Schneider Electric provide uh, specific technical support to process optimization in different industries? Uh, yes. So I'd say the answer is a cautious yes. Um, does Schneider provide specific tech support? Yes. We can certainly help clients uh, walk through the process uh, and the the systems integration that's needed to bridge that gap. You know, between the uh, to get you know get the results right, process efficiency. But what we do need is an uh, kind of a committed stakeholder on the other side, right? To 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 work with us and and to bring the 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 local uh, facility knowledge and the domain expertise. So we will need the commitment 
on the other side for us to be successful together. But yes, we do. We do that. It all goes time. goes both ways. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right. Thanks for the great questions and thanks for the excellent answers. Uh, and thanks again to our great speaker, Ram Kaushik, for sharing your time and your expertise. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, Schneider Electric, for sponsoring today's event. And now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering and Schneider Electric, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>